All right, I'm here with Robert Bean, consultant with Indoor Indoor Climates? Indoor Climate Consultants. Indoor Climate Consultants. Indoor Sorry, Robert. Consultants. Yeah. And uh, Robert's actually getting ready to speak this morning, but I scored a coup by getting him to interview ahead of time. Right. It's, uh, it's the first uh, interview of the day today. Robert, it's a, a pleasure to speak with you. You have such a reputation in the industry for excellence and uh, thought leadership. You in know our how much that's cost me, right? <laughs> like, I've drained my bank account to have people tell me that before I got here. Or, you know, it's, it's you know, brutal. I've drained my account, too, for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, uh, Robert, I've been asking a bunch of industry experts a few random questions, especially as it relates to uh, building houses in the south where I am, and then a couple general questions. So, let's start with uh, a couple HVAC specific questions that I get on my blog often, right. which is, you know, if I run a good manual J, why do I need a dehumidifier, or should I not need a dehumidifier if I've really designed and installed the system correctly? Well, certainly, even if you've done a really good low calculation, that's going to tell you uh, what your ventilation requirements are going to be. And obviously, the occupants in the home are going to tell you what the what the dehumidification load is going to be. And you might have other features in the house that you know is going to define what the uh, dehumidification load is going to going to be. So those are going to define the HVAC system. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're going to put in a separate dehumidifier or whether you're going to incorporate it into the air handling uh, unit, the projects that we do they're big enough um, that you know we're going to be looking at uh, chilled water instead of refrigerant-based uh, systems in our coils. And so we'll be using water coils. Uh, for, for dehumidifying, wow. which makes it, uh, the, the water-based systems are a little bit better in terms of controllability. Mm -hmm. We can really tune them down into the low dehumidification or high, depending on what we want to do with the water temperatures and the flow rate. So we have a little bit more flexibility that way. Oh, that's really cool. Hey, let me piggyback on that since you, you mentioned radiant cooling. Right. Uh, Christoph Irwin and his crew in Austin do, right. all, do all my uh, HVAC design. They do all my rating and testing. And he's been talking about radiant cooling as the next big thing for Austin. Right. What's your What's your thoughts on that? So if, if they're going to do heating, uh, then they may as well look at doing cooling. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of benefits to rating cooling. One of the things that people get all freaked out over is this condensation uh, problem. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a problem because you do dehumidification for controlling bacteria in the space. You mm -hmm. do it for material stabilities in the space. Uh, and you do it for the dimensional stability, uh, dimensional stability of hygro uh, hygroscopic materials like wood. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can, tr and, and just even for preserving preserving artwork and, yeah. and so uh, musical instruments. So you should be doing dehumidification regardless of what type of HVAC system you're, you're using. So uh, based on that principle, you can do radiant cooling anywhere in the world and, and it's done. So, you know, Bangkok Airport, Bangkok's a pretty humid place, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba Hydro Building, that Winnipeg is a, is a really humid place and that's a 17 story uh, building, all radiant uh, cooled. Um, so, you know, it, Cooling is done everywhere, yeah. and it's just that making sure that uh, you take the right approach, and that just means doing your, again, your load calculations, latent load calculations, regulating that moisture in the space, and then you can do the do the cooling. So it's it's done, it's done everywhere, uh, just a little bit more challenging on the design side, which is why we like it. Yeah, so uh, a, a follow-up question. Yesterday, yeah. one of the speakers talked about a radiant waterfall right. uh, cooler that would both cool and dehumidify, and right. for a few minutes it blew my mind until I thought about how a right. cool waterfall could actually dehumidify. Will you break it down for us, tell us how that works? Right, so well, I'll give you an example. Actually, the again go back to a Manitoba Hydro building, and what they have is they have this cascading waterfall, and they and of course it's cool, and uh, in the space, of course, if it's uh, if it is uh, moist and hot, and you've got a cool uh, source, it mm -hmm. just uh, you know it just. Uh, uh, controls that moisture, uh, brings it in, and uh, dehumidifies the space with it. So. It's an interesting uh, strategy, um, but it's not without its its flaws. Yeah, you know, because good. you're talking about water, uh, which means that uh, and water temperature and bacteria. So um, it's not just enough to put in the waterfall. You have to think in terms of okay, what what could happen to this water over a period of time as it as it operates as a desiccant. I guess you could yeah. call it. So the basically the water is cool enough that the dew point is below the air's dew point. Right. And so literally as that water. Uh, rushes through the space, the humidity or the water that's in the air is going to condense inside the water that's running through right. and get more water. So if you, like right now, Matt, if you know, if we head out to the 
the, the speaking area there, and there's all those um, jugs of water, right? Yeah. And they're all condensing right now, right? That's right. So that, and it's, it's a waterfall, right? The water's just ripping off those containers. Well, that's the same thing, but on a bigger scale. Wow, that's really cool to yeah. think about. Let me ask you another question that's sort of related. You know, I love talking about HVAC systems and, and yeah. the best systems out there. If you could design a system for your house, let's say you're building a two, three, four thousand square foot house, yeah. money's no object. What's the absolute best system you can envision for a, for a house? You know, we would do a hybrid, and in fact, that's all we've ever done. And what that means is that we separate the ventilation system from the thermal comfort system. Mm. And so we're ventilating uh, year round, and depending on you know what we need for ventilation, and we're very much we take the the position that uh, no standard is going to tell us exactly what we need for ventilation. We'll use it as a guideline, right. but we may have needs that are exceed the standard or needs that are less than the standard. So and we, of course you're referring to ASHRAE 62.2 probably. I'm alluding to ASHRAE 62.2 <laughs> and all that others that are on the committee battle that one out. And they're doing a good job. You know, out of, the, out of those fights comes good stuff it's eventually. Good that we have the conversation. It, it is, and uh, and it's always entertaining, right? Yeah. So um, so we would have, you know, de uh, separate ventilation dedicated, probably MERV 12 filtration in it. And uh, we would we would be uh, using uh, heating and cooling coils, chilled water and, and heated water systems, and then we'd have a separate uh, system for uh, the heating and the cooling. Mm -hmm. And we're big fans of Radiant; always have been. We like the fact what it, you know, just the environments that it creates mm -hmm. uh, from an architectural and interior design point of view. It's just yeah. it really keeps a clean yeah. uh, space, which is really nice. And uh, one of the benefits, and we're going to talk about that this morning, actually, is is uh, the ability to run at really low temperatures and heating and really high temperatures and cooling. Wow. And for the people. That or your audience, they'll really appreciate that in terms of efficiency of heat pumps, chillers, boilers, that the, that efficiency is a function of the, of, the, of the temperature coming back through the device. So the, the lower we can run that water and the heating back through it, or the higher in cooling, uh, then the more uh, energy efficiency we're, we're getting out of that equipment. The Daikin uh, had a unit that we really liked, and unfortunately they, uh, I guess, uh, are, have pulled out, and awesome. yeah, which is too bad. So, um, you know, we have a project right now where we've spec'd out one of uh, mass uh, space pack units, a five-ton reverse uh, for reverse, time, uh, reverse uh, uh, chiller, and uh, that's what we're resorting to right now. One of the challenges we are finding, Matt, is that uh, certainly as building performance goes up, is trying to find small chillers, like in the one, two yeah. ton range. There's nothing. There is nothing, and so we've actually started to look at uh, industrial coolers mm -hmm. that uh, they don't come with sear ratings, <laughs> right? right? But right, but right. Uh, but they can cool if they can cool the fluid. Right. Uh, then then uh, that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of the other manufacturers will start to wake up, not only on the on the chill water stuff but the boilers and the furnaces yeah. all of these equipment these manufacturers really need to start uh, replying or responding to these low loads I mean look at what's been talked about here yeah. today, you know in the last couple of yeah. days right low load buildings and you can't find the equipment it's hard to find it yeah. yeah I mean you're talking about buildings in the south where I am that are over a thousand square feet to the ton and some people are pushing 2,000 square feet to the ton yeah then that's just those are phenomenal numbers I mean people used to think about 300 square foot right. you know, per ton you find jobs where you know they put in the equipment and it's actually maybe well you know they're, they're not they're not doing the loads right and it's yeah. but if you can get a thousand square foot out of a ton that's or, or 1500 you're i mean that's just phenomenal yeah. right but yeah. that's what's happening and that's that's the real world right yeah. and same thing on the heating side you know like typically if i go back into our archives and we look at loads you know we would see 45 30 bts per hour per square foot but you know we're starting to see five seven bts per hour per square foot it's a different game Right, and so low temperature, low loads. We need smaller equipment with uh, even with greater turndown ratios. And uh, manufacturers, if you're w listening, <laughs> that's that's what we need. Yeah, yeah. I agree. yeah. Tell me about the uh, ventilation system that you're talking about. Right. When you talk about a separate ventilation system, I automatically think about a uh, you know a ducted ERV or maybe uh, one of those types of systems. Right. So our standard is is going to be an HRV. HRV. Okay. Yeah. And one of the challenges that we find on the HRVs, of course, is is filtration. Getting the the, the filtration that we're looking for yeah. for our clients and then also incorporating heating and cooling coils and our in our climate where I'm from uh, you know it's not uncommon to get down to minus 40 so you know Matt if you want to send some of your warm weather up and I'll send some cold weather down and then they'll meet somewhere and then we'll just use that okay so but, so that's that's the that's the challenge for us so what we typically are doing um, just to, so that we're not in increasing the static pressure on the units that we're oversizing our coils um, and so we're doing that for pressure but we're also doing that because we're using low temperatures 
temperatures and in heating and high temperatures and cooling. So on the traditional cooling coil, you know, they might design it for around 45 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Well, we're designing it for 55 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So because of that, uh, you know, our coils have to be much larger. But that, that's a one-time capital cost. And what we get for the lifetime of the building is that that benefit of having that high temperature going back to the heat pump or the chiller yeah. or whatever, right? Which yeah. just, just enables all the efficiency that that uh, manufacturer, you know, put into their literature yeah. and, and their unit, yeah. yeah. Robert, tell me about what concerns you in our industry today, whether that's HVAC or construction in general. What do you see out there that's a concern? Illiteracy. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my big concern. You know, we have so much going on, Matt. As you know, uh, we're learning lots about buildings, probably more so than we've ever learned in the past. It just seems in this last couple of years, you know, guys like the Building Science Corporation and all of their colleagues from the last 10, 15 years are doing lots of good research work. And so this is coming out. Uh, some of the technology in the HVAC systems is changing. Our knowledge of human beings and physiology in spaces, so in terms of indoor environmental ergonomics. So we have the IEQ coming out, we have equipment uh, that's coming in, we have the knowledge of buildings, and we have a lot of people who are illiterate about these three things and how they all fit together. Yeah, yeah so that's my concern is that, um, that we don't take advantage of this great knowledge. You know, the pieces are there, let's figure out a way to teach people how to put them together, and if we can do that, and that's part of my presentation today, is figuring out how to do that, we'll end up with some just some great architecture. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I agree. Piggybacking on that, one of the questions I've asked a bunch of people is, we got a lot of gray hairs here at Building Science Camp, <laughs> but that really? next, really? not not you, of course, <laughs> not you. I didn't mean you, Robert. There's some gray hairs. <laughs> Maybe one or two. Yeah. Some without gray hairs. Yeah, yeah a couple <laughs> without any hair at all. Yeah, might be but how do we how do we educate that next generation that's just getting out of architecture school or it's just getting into the trades or construction? What's the methods for educating those you know 25 year olds that are eager to learn? Yeah, that's a really good question. I you got to join their world, and I you know uh, some of the uh, education providers that are offering online courses. I'm a really big fan of those, yeah. and we've. Uh, you know, we've experienced it. We've developed courses, and we have kids that are uh, kids. They're you know young men, right? Young women that are in their 20s, uh, mid 20s, late 20s, and they get the online learning. Yeah. Like they have no problem sitting down in front of a computer at their pace and and engaging. And they're also engaged with all the social media, mm -hmm. you know. And so what's neat about that is that when we're delivering courses online, they know how to get us, you know, on LinkedIn or yeah. Twitter or yeah. Facebook, and they're comfortable asking questions and an open forum and I just I think that's so cool because if they're willing to learn in an open forum that means everybody else can learn from what they're learning yeah. they're asking the questions and people in the in the background you know the gray hair guys right right are watching the questions the dialogues right yeah. and they're and they're learning stuff so yeah. I think I think the young people are actually teaching the old people stuff and, and the old guys aren't admitting it they're just in the background right you know, you know what I found is that some of the folks that listen to my uh, videos or what or you know read my blog are, are the younger architects younger builders yeah. and once they get a spark of building science Science, just like I, I did 15 years ago, I wanted to learn everything I could about it and, and right. you know, know that there was so much knowledge I needed to soak in. And I think I'm really seeing that out there right now. Yeah, I, I agree. The the building, well, the, just the term building science has, a, it's, it's got a sexy factor it to does. it, right? It and so, so when people hear, you know, are they asking, what do you do? Well, I'm into building science, you know, well, then they start asking questions or they leave, right? That's right. That's <laughs> like right. their face drains of their blood and go, oh man, I'm stuck with this guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, but if they do stick around, then they want to know more, yeah. right? Because everybody is get, living in somewhere, yeah. right? An apartment or a house or whatever. And, you know, if they're sitting and they're talking to somebody that knows something about their building, they'll ask questions. Yeah. yeah. Or, or leave and say weird things about you, right? And the other thing I find is that if I ask people about their experiences, that's the thing that connects with them. Like, hey, how comfortable was your last house? Well, our last house was beautiful, but it wasn't that comfortable. Or my bedroom was super hot or whatever. And the same with builders out there. Hey, what callbacks have you had? What pain points have you had? Right. Oh, you know, building science can solve that for you because we can figure out what the root cause of that problem was and we can correct that on the next time you build or for that homeowner who's calling you right now. Right. You know, in many ways, it's uh, like deconstructing a cake backwards. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? That's right. And uh, so if you know what, what the ingredients should have been in that cake yeah. and uh, you can start to look at that and say, well, you know, this was a missing ingredient or this wasn't in the right quantity or this wasn't assembled in the right way. It really helps us understand these uh, these buildings, and uh, so I I think that 
bri that conversation bridges a lot of dialogue. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I agree. Robert, thank you so much for your uh, for your time. Really fun to talk to you and good luck out there this yeah, morning. Thanks very much, Matt. All right, we'll see you later. All right.